All right, everybody, hail and welcome back to another episode of Midgard Musings. My name is Jesse, and I am the host here on this channel. And if things pertaining to Norse heathenry or Germanic paganism or what is quite oftentimes in modern day usually referred to as also true, um, I invite you to please subscribe to the channel right down here below. Check the description area for my link tree and all the ways that you can support Midgard Musings. And when you do subscribe and you don't want to miss anything, make sure you ding the bell notifications and select all so that way you get notified whenever I do upload new content. All right, so today's video is a continuation of a, a sort of mini-series that I ran here on the channel a while back and sort of just took a pause with. There were some other things that were coming through on my mind that I wanted to do uh, with the channel, none of which is going away uh, per se, but um, this mini-series that I would call just simply Deity Discussions uh, basically surrounds discussion around the actual figures in Norse mythology, the, the sacred gods and goddesses of our mythology and in the lore. Uh, I usually will bring up a you know bit of historical information, some of the etymological historical parts of like their names, their regions, you know how they were perhaps venerated in uh, ancient times, and then sort of open it up to my own understanding and my own interpretation of said deity, and then invite all of you to share your comments down below and let everybody know what you think of the video, plus what you think of the qualities or the characteristics of this specific figure, this specific deity. Alright, so now that we got that part out of the way, um, as you can tell by the title of today's video, this is episode 17 in this series for Deity Discussions. I hope to try and do more of these, maybe on like a monthly basis um, going forward and, and revisit some of the, uh, or not revisit the, 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 the deities that I already did, but just kind of revisit the series and, and bring this more back uh, into the repertoire of videos that I do. Uh, but as you can tell by the title, today I was going to talk about Njord. So as I've always done with the notes that I have, I've done some research and wanted to just have these reference points for everybody that's watching and listening to kind of go off from. So Njord, uh, which is Old Norse Njorder, is uh, doesn't really we don't we're not really sure like the etymology or linguistically where this name the, the meaning of the name comes from. There's going to be some more information towards the middle or the end of this video. Um, about some perhaps uh, roots from where this name comes from. But Njord is a uh, principal god or one of the primary gods of the Vanir tribe, much like Freya and Freyr. So uh, Njord is from the Vanir tribe of the gods and he's also a honorary member, if you will, of the Aesir, the, the war gods, the war class like Odin and Thor and Tyr and Freyg and, and all the others that we hear about in the lore that are Aesir gods. Njord is a kind of honorary member of the Aesir tribe. Uh, this happened when the uh, after the Aesir Vanir war in our mythology anyways um, Njord and uh, his children who are Freya and Freyr respectively um, also became kind of honorary members. They were they were given up to the to the Aesir as sort of like hostages or whatever. Um, and it is said in the lore that Freya and Freyr are Njord's um, children who Njord sired from an un unnamed uh, source. Like there's an unnamed, it says sister, mother, could be one of the bo one of both, you know? Um, but anyways, that figure, that, uh, that, that figure, that, that deity, if you will, is not named, at least in, in the lore. And it is thought, based on some linguistic evidence, that it's possibly Nerthus. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit later on in this video about that connection and hopefully clear up any things. I don't think that Njord and Nerthus um, are two different beings per se. I think that there, as we go on into this video, as we talk a little bit more about it, that you'll see why that is. Um, but it is said in the lore that Njord lives near the sea in Osgard. Um, in a house called Noatun, which is to mean ship enclosure. 
Um, and it's most likely due to the fact that Njord is a god that is most closely um, associated with, um, you know, the, the wind, the seas. Um, he's a fertility god, a prosperity god, a god of wealth and prosperity. But he is most, um, it, the, the connections with Njord tend to be the sea and such. So his home being by the sea uh, makes sense because that way he can hear the, the crashes of the waves and you know all day all night and smell the beautiful aroma of the sea the sea air uh, the salty sea air blowing in uh, from them so it makes sense that his home or his abode in the lore would be close to or, or near or at the sea so again with Njord the, the the things that we find him closely associated with are wealth fertility of course the sea and seafaring because in northern Europe and, and at the time you know a lot of a lot of the uh, the wealth and things that were uh, accumulated by the northern people were done over sea raids and things of that nature. So, that, so they had to have safe passage going over the waters and, and things of that nature. So there was a close connection between Njord and the prosperity of, of seafaring folk, you know, those that would go out there and, and do that sort of thing. So fishing, you know, um, uh, going out on raids, that sort of thing, it was, it was largely assumed that the favor of Njord was invoked, or they would invoke Njord to have a safe passage um, and to keep them safe in those in those journeys and in those sorts of activities. Okay, there is a saying, at least from what I've understood or heard, is uh, among the Norse people from at one point that it was, if you were especially wealthy, or if you had a lot of good wealth, that you were said to be as rich as Njord. Um, it, there is one particular source from Adam of Bremen um, that tells us in, in the case of war, uh, at least for the folks in Sweden at the time, that um, the Swedes would sacrifice, uh, they would make sacrifices to Odin and um, for like uh, bounty in, uh, for, or for the greatness of kings and for the wealth and for the prosperity of kings and royalty, um, but that uh, certain men would drink uh, toasts to both Njord and Freyr for fruitful harvests and peace and prosperity and that sort of thing. So there's a very close connection. Again, Vanir gods being those of uh, peace, not war, uh, fertility, wealth, plenty, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of connotations with Njord and any of, I guess, most of the Vanir gods that um, are, are closely connected with, you know, peaceful times and prosperity and good harvests and that sort of thing. Now, the biggest story in the lore that we all know of uh, that mentions Njord is when Skadi comes to Asgard to seek vengeance for the death of her father, Thjatsi. And she ends up uh, ultimately marrying Njord. Um, if you watch one of the uh, videos that I have annotated up here, you'll see one of my last deity discussion videos was on Skadi, and in that video I go a little bit more in depth about it. But it's a pretty popular and fun video, or, uh, story of the lore, right? So, so Skadi comes to Asgard, she has to pick a husband um, by only looking at the, the feet of the gods and she tries to find the most handsomest, most attractive looking feet uh, in, in hopes of acquiring Baldur as her husband, thinking that while well, the best looking feet have to be belonging to the best of the gods, the brightest of the gods, the best looking of the gods, which was Baldur, and of course she picked the feet of Njord, thinking that they were the handsomest feet of all and it had to be Baldur, but it turns out to be in fact Njord. So Skadi and Njord for a short period of time are said to be wed and husband and wife in the lore and of course that doesn't go over very well for very long because Skadi is attracted to the mountains and to the cold and to the wilderness of, of, of the higher elevations whereas Njord is more at comfy, more at comfort, comfort, get it out eventually, more comfortable and uh, more attracted to the seaside you know and uh, those uh, those areas. So their union doesn't stay together for very long, but that is pretty much like the only um, reference in lore that we have of, of Njord. So now, Nord do, Njord, I should say, does have a, a pretty prominent presence among different Scandinavian uh, cultures. There are areas and towns even named to him, and we see throughout history that if a god or deity had a very uh, important role um, in the society and in, the, and in the, the, the culture of the people that there were place names uh, that contained the names of those specific deities. We see it with Thor as well in, in, in various places. 
Um, but one place that still exists to this day is in uh, Denmark, in Copenhagen, or at least north of Copenhagen. And if I say the name incorrectly, if I pronounce the name incorrectly, um, for any of the uh, Danes out here, any of the Danish people that may be watching, I apologize, but I believe it's pronounced Neirum, Neirum, uh, which is, again is north of Copenhagen, and it means Njord's home, or Noten. So it's first recorded as, the, like there's been villages in this area, I guess, for quite some time, but the first recording of this particular village being called Neirum is uh, first recorded in the year 1186. So we have already gone past, you know, the Viking Age at that point. Um, so the the, uh, the 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 place name Neirun, Njord's home, Njotun, whatever, as uh, recorded by Bishop Absalon, he says it says that he gave all of his holdings, all of his uh, possessions and things, including Neirun, to uh, Roxidla, and it is believed that the name refers to the name of, of Njord's home, Noten. Or Noten. So, because of the connection in the area, geographically and all this kind of stuff, I guess it just it makes sense that in that region, Njord was particularly, a, or, or was probably a god particularly venerated or admired and, and worshipped and that sort of thing. Now I'm going to change or switch gears a little bit from talking about Njord because that's about it. That's about all we have at least documented or written down, but what we also have is some information uh, from Tacitus in Germania. We hear um, someone be quoting some things from Germania where Tacitus mentions Nerthus. And I, the reason why I want to talk about Nerthus is, is going to be explained in the rest of this part. Uh, so there were some tribes, there were some Germanic tribes that uh, Tacitus is, is talking about. And the names of these tribes, I'm probably again going to butcher because these are old Germanic names, um, but they were the Rudigni, the Aviones, the Anglili, the Varini, uh, the Edoses, the Sarinis, and the Nuitonis. I will put everything down in the description area for you to reference and read it yourself, um, because again, I'm probably horribly butchering those names. Um, but they, all of these tribes in this area, shared a common worship of Nerthus, or as Tacitus came to know this as Mother Earth. So they believe, this is, according, this is according to Tacitus, they believe that she takes part in human affairs, riding in a chariot among her people. On an island of the sea stands an uh, involatile grove, in which, veiled with a cloth, is a chariot that none but the priest may touch. The priest can feel the presence of the goddess in this holy of holies, and attends her with the deepest reverence, as her chariot is drawn only by cows. Then follow days of rejoicing and merrymaking in every place that she uh, condescends to visit and sojourn in. No one goes to war, no one takes up arms, uh, every iron object is locked away. Then and then only are peace and quiet known and welcomed until the goddess, when she has had enough of the society of men, is restored to her sacred uh, precinct by the priest. After that, the chariot, the vestments, um, and, believe it if you will, the goddess herself, are cleansed in a secluded lake. This, ser this service is performed by slaves uh, who are immediately afterwards drowned in the lake. Thus, mystery begets terror and a pious reluctance to ask what that sight can be which is seen only by men doomed to die. So it's very interesting that um, in, 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 in a lot of other the things that Tacitus either wrote about or heard about, uh, and then wrote down later. I don't think he was an actual eyewitness to these things, but he was writing things down that others were eyewitness to, that there's um, human sacrifice involved many, many times. We hear about it in, uh, in, in the, the nine-year sacrifice in Uppsala, at the Temple of Uppsala, in old, old Uppsala, Sweden. And now we hear it here as well, that the slaves or that the, the figures that were um, given to perform some of the ceremony that they were then sacrificed uh, and drowned or bogged in a lake as, 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 as the gift to the goddess. So Nerthus's name also suggests a connection with Vanir deities, again because of the whole earth fertility aspect of things. Um, be, the old N Norse name for Njord, right? We said before, Njorther, Njorther. You see there's like a, you know, there's, there's similar linguistics going on here. Um, it's exactly what the Proto-Germanic name for Nerthus probably would have looked like. 
you know, so when you say Nerthus, that's a Latinized version of it, Neorther, Neorther, you, know, you see there's very close similarities to it. Um, two main theories have been put together or put forward to, to account for this. Um, in one, Nerthus and Njord form a divine pair, much like Freya and Freyr, you know? So the, the two uh, kind of combined create this divine pair, as it were. Um, and proponents of this theory can also point to evidence from either grammatical or, or frequent plural usages of the name Njord. So effectively, the Njords, you know, combine them together. Uh, in early Old Norse poetry. The second theory, though, argues that Nerthus and Njord um, was either hermaphroditic or transitioned from being a female goddess sort of deity to being the, the, the male deity that we read about in, like, the Edda, or the poetic Edda, you know, where Njord and Skadi are married and that sort of thing. Um, but given that Tacitus's identification of Nerthus uh, in his Germania was that of uh, Terra Mater, is Mother Earth. Um, it's pretty tempting, or, or, or uh, you know, we could we could also surmise that um, identifying Nerthus um, with Yord, which we hear about in the lore too, is uh, Thor's mother. Um, I I per particularly think that that's the same one, you know, because Njord, Yord, it's it, it the word itself is in there, um, Nerthus. Uh, Mother Earth, so I, I feel like this is definitely um, kind of one and the same, but that over time and over history um, has probably transitioned from being a female deity that the or old Germanic tribes uh, venerated to being separated a bit more and, and, and added to the mythology of, of, of things and added to the lore as it kind of grew and, and whatnot over time. So that's the like the historical side of things when it comes to Njord and, and the, the connection with Nerthus. Um, so now, at this point, I usually will tell you my feelings uh, or, or my either involvement or connection with said deities. And if I've ever, you know, had a, uh, a moment or a time that I worked with them in ritual. And I am originally, um, where I'm originally from, you know, I live in the state of Tennessee right now. I'm landlocked. There's no ocean. There's no seas. You know, there's rivers. There's lakes. There's creeks. There's you know, smaller bodies of water, that sort of thing, but there's no saltwater oceanfront property or anywhere that you can go here in Tennessee to reach the ocean. Where I am from, though, however, is surrounded by the sea. I'm originally from Long Island, New York, which has a bay. You know, um, I was, I was t five, ten minutes or, or so from the Long Island Sound, which is the body of water that separates um, the north shore of Long Island to Connecticut. You know, my parents grew up near the Bay Area, which is this, between the south and uh, north shores of Long Island. And then, you know, within a short drive away from, from the Atlantic Ocean in either direction, you know what I mean? I can go to the north shore and be there in 45 minutes, head down to the south shore, be there in 45 minutes or so. So, I grew up around and near the sea, you know? That is always going to feel like home to me. And so, I feel like for those folks, for the people who either live near that or have, you know, connection to the sea in some sort of way, that, that, that for those people, it may, it may deem them well or bode us well to try and work with Njord uh, in our pagan practices. I don't feel like it, it really works right now for me where I am located geographically because, again, I'm nowhere near the sea. I'm nowhere near where Njord feels most at home and, and loves to be, according to the lore, right? Um, but when I am back home, when I am close to the sea, and when I am, you know, near those places, or I'm near a coastal area, then I, I then then that sort of calls to me, and then I want to, you know, do things to to honor Njord and um, maybe gift to him or that sort of thing, just as a nod and as a remembrance of this is where I've come from, and this is where I I will always feel extremely at home at as well. So it bears bringing up or bears mentioning, I think, that when it comes to venerating the gods and, and working with the gods and our various practices, you know, what you want to do, who you want to choose to venerate and that sort of thing, I mean, that's your hall, your call, and you do what you want to do. Um, I just personally feel like when it comes to some of these gods and goddesses that are particularly mentioned to be, you know, only near or close to a certain area, you know, Skadi with the mountains, um, uh, you know, Thor and, and the storms and the wind and all that kind of thing. And then now Njord or 
uh, being close to the sea. I feel like if you're not really geographically close to some of those areas that you may not get as big of an impact from the gods, that specific god or goddess. Not to say that you can't because I feel like there's, there's more to the gods than just their geographical locations. But in my practices and as I've come to grow as a heathen myself, I'm like, you know, if I'm in the middle of the desert um, or I'm in here in Tennessee, landlocked, it's like that's, New York not isn't really the one that I would uh, really have a lot to do with in my practices. Now, if I was going out on a voyage, if I was, you know, sailing across the seas, if I was maybe taking a cruise or something along those lines, maybe I would want to, you know, gift to New York or something beforehand to ask for, you know, calm waters and, and uh, you know, to keep, to keep the boisterous, you know, uh, uh, volatile nature of like Ron and um, uh, and Aegir and them and you know, those like giant forces those Jotun forces at bay you know to keep us safe over the seas maybe I would be more inclined to do it during those times but as like a normal everyday practice even or, or as a you know tribal gathering sort of thing I don't feel like here Njord wouldn't be the one to necessarily fit that bill we have Freyr because we are landlocked we, we work the land or we are you know in the you know, agriculture uh, capital, really Tennessee. Anyway, it's it's you know it's like a, it's all about agriculture, so that makes more sense to me. It feels right. It feels better, and it's worked for us. It's worked for me personally. It's also worked for uh, tribal level type stuff around here. So for for my tribe at least. So I'm curious to know what you all think, right? So now I've given you my ideas um, about Niord and, and read some things to you that give you some historical backing, and now I'm kind of curious to know what you think you know do you and your pagan practices have anything to do with Nior? do you find a place for him in your pagan practices and or if not do you want to and, and if so you know what do you think would be good to to incorporate you know would it be sea water would it be sea shells would it be driftwood would it be various things you know anything that is that comes to mind I would be really interested to hear what you all have to think about this video and then any of the other videos in my deity discussion series which you can find in annotated cards along the way here now so that concludes today's video it concludes today's episode of our deity discussion series and i hope that you all enjoyed it and found it entertaining if you do please give it a video a thumbs up share it around get some more people involved here don't forget to comment down below and subscribe and until we talk again in the next video hail and we'll see you soon